Have you ever wanted to live the life of a wildlife biologist? Well, you don't have to have a degree in biology to make a contribution to the scientific community. We'll take a look at how you can become a citizen scientist next on Georgia Outdoors. Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible by a grant from Mary Hall Singleton and by the Imlay Foundation. Birds and insects are an essential part of a healthy ecosystem. Wildlife biologists spend a lot of time tracking changes in populations and migration patterns. But you don't have to be a wildlife biologist to study birds. Bird watching is a growing pastime, and many birders are becoming citizen scientists, using their skills to make a contribution to our knowledge of the species. Volunteers participate in bird and butterfly counts across the country each year, but it all starts with a healthy curiosity and a good pair of binoculars. A great place to get acquainted with birding is at an event like this one, the Colonial Coast Birding Festival, held every October on Jekyll Island. This is the Georgia Colonial Coast Birding and Nature Festival, and it's built around the Georgia Colonial Coast Birding Trail. This is our fourth year. It's amazing how excited people get when they find out about how wonderful the Georgia coast is. It's such a unique place to come because it has a good combination of salt marsh, ocean, a little culture, a little history, and a lot of birds. The Rookery Exhibit Hall is a good place to browse field guides, try out the latest equipment, and congregate with fellow birders. Well, I think we're going to go have some fun. But the festival doesn't end here. Guided outings to birding hotspots around the Georgia coast are a major attraction. There's only three bridges out to Barrier Islands on the Georgia coast. One out to Tybee, one out to St. Simons, and one out to Jekyll. So we provide trips to Blackbeard Island, Sapelo, St. Catharines, Asaba. We also take people into the Okefenokee Swamp. October is a great time for birding on the coast. No wonder the organizers picked this time of year for the Colonial Coast Birding Festival. In addition to the species that are here year round, migratory birds are making their way south for the winter and Jekyll Island is a great location for the festival's home base. Though the smallest of Georgia's barrier islands, it's accessible by bridge and contains a variety of well-preserved habitats. Jean Kefferl leads a popular field trip right here on the island. Jekyll Island is one of the best birding spots in, in Georgia. It's a, a nice barrier island that you can drive to and it has a variety of habitats. So this is a great place for our festival and a great place to go bird watching. I like a challenge, and birding is a challenge. I am a kind of person who likes to explore new habitats and new things, and this is a way of looking and exploring new, new places, is to look for new birds and new places. The Colonial Coast Birding Festival is named for the Colonial Coast Birding Trail. More than 300 species of birds have been spotted over the 18 sites that form the trail. The Colonial Coast Birding Trail is an effort by the Department of Natural Resources in conjunction with a number of cooperators to try to enhance birding opportunities along the Georgia coast. And we have selected 18 of the very best places for people to bird along this area. Each one is different, each one has its own plants and animals. And so we think that people, both Georgians and visitors to our state, will have some fantastic tourism opportunities right along the Georgia coast that they may not have known were there. The trail features historic sites such as Huffle Broadfield Plantation and Fort McAllister, as well as valuable natural resources like the Okefenokee Swamp. Attendees at the festival learn the ins and outs of bird watching from a number of experts on hand to share their knowledge. So you had your chickadee calling, we've got a black and white warbler coming in. That's got a little dark around the eyes. Let me... These volunteers are getting a taste of bird banding 
an approach to population monitoring used by wildlife biologists all over the world. A unique band is placed on the leg of an individual bird, but the birds must be handled with the utmost care. This helps biologists keep records on movement and population changes and allows for better management and protection of the species. This is the 28th year of operation for this banding station. We're here every year, basically for three weeks. We've selected what we perceive as the prime time to be here for the migrating warblers, vireos, sparrows, all types of songbirds that migrate through this area. The Jekyll Island Banding Station attracts all sorts of volunteers. On the average, the volunteer, it could be anybody. We have MDs, we have carpenters, we have salespeople. We do have our requirements on who we allow to handle the birds. They have to be trained, they have to meet our criteria. There are jobs here to do that don't involve actually handling the birds. 8.3 grams. Our dad is directly fed to the Bandon Laboratory in Patuxent, Maryland, which is part of the U.S. Geological Survey. You want to release it? Yes, please. Besides the Colonial Coast Birding Festival, there are many other birding events in Georgia. One of the newest occurs in the spring, and it's just for kids, the Youth Birding Competition. This statewide event involves teams across Georgia with one goal in mind, spot as many species as they can in one day. The Youth Birding Competition is an event that gives kids an opportunity to compete against each other as teams. So they get together with their friends or fellow students and they work as a, uh, as a group to identify birds uh, traveling from habitat to habitat. There he goes. We met up with a group of students from the Darlington School in Rome. Over the course of the day, they'll work their way from Rome all the way to Charlie Elliott Wildlife Center, and there's no time to waste. It was still dark outside when we started, so we focused mainly on the birds' songs versus actually seeing the birds. And then as it got lighter, we were able to use our binoculars and the scope and actually see some birds. Is that a kingbird? No, uh, tree swallow. Tree swallow, yeah. They're so cute. They are cute. It's really pretty simple. The identification is supposed to be left up to the kids. It's their responsibility to find the birds, to identify the birds as a team. A milk American crow. That's good. It's American crow. American crow. All right, American crow. We saw a pine warbler, remember? Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. They can talk amongst themselves and sort of debate back and forth what they think it is, and then they have to come to a consensus before they put it on the official list. Branch that sticks out the Not farthest, at the bottom right. Oh, yeah. 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 We've got a good feeling that's a yellow-breasted chat. We took both of our groups uh, today for the birding competition. I have a seven-year-old group, two seven-year-olds and a six-year-old. We took that group and we took a group of five 18-year-olds. The teams begin their day at Georgia Highlands College, a campus with a diversity of habitats. They have a nice lake behind their campus, and underneath that lake where the, uh, where the overflow is, there's a, uh, a wetland, and that wetland has been dammed up by beavers. They have a nice boardwalk that goes right through the whole swamp where you can see lots of different migratory birds, lots of other wetland wildlife. And wetlands like this, offer a lot of dead trees because the water drowns the roots and kills the trees. When beavers come in, they provide not only an aquatic habitat, but they provide a lot of nest sites for other birds, including tree swallows, bluebirds, uh, and lots of different kinds of woodpeckers. Wetlands tend to be good for several reasons. Uh, one reason is because there's a lot of insect food there. And what makes them a good birding location is because they tend to have few big trees. And so therefore, we get to see the birds lower down and closer up. The birds that we're seeing today are basically a lot of warblers, red-winged blackbird, and uh, birds of prey and things like that. We saw the indigo bunting, and it's just such a beautiful bird. It's got this blue color that's just amazing. It was so cool to see, because I never thought I would ever see one. I see one! We've seen a lot of warblers, which are really hard to find. We've trained a lot to find those. We've had several tests over them with um, different pictures to identify. Those are you can't find I'm just curious. Oh, that's what it was, common yellows, right? I believe it was the male, the female. We've also found some woodpeckers. We found a downy woodpecker and a hairy woodpecker, and those are always fun to watch. Birds can be hard to spot and even harder to correctly identify. Identification often requires knowing what birds look like and what they sound like as well. The group uses a program called BirdPod, 
downloaded to an MP3 player to call in birds. With this new technology, bird watchers can carry bird songs from hundreds of species right in their pockets. We use the recorded bird sounds uh, to try to lure birds in and mimic their calls. And we thought that would be either A, a great tool to confirm bird calls that we did hear, or try to lure birds to flush them out or even bring them in. This technique can be very helpful in calling out birds you wouldn't normally see. However, using bird calls to lure in birds should be done sparingly, as it could agitate and confuse the birds. So far, so good. The morning isn't over, and the teams have already identified more than 50 species of birds. Nestled in the hills of North Georgia, stretching over more than 28,000 acres, Berry College is the largest contiguous campus in the world, and its diversity of habitats provides great birding opportunities. Berry is so beautiful if you've ever been out there. It's just, there's so much wildlife. Once you are introduced to the different types of birds, it's so neat to see what you can find. Bird watching is interesting because you're able to get out in the outdoors. It's kind of like you have you have a certain objective or mission that you're trying to accomplish rather than just going out and looking at things. There's different levels of birding and so it's kind of a challenge. I like birding because, well one reason is that it's fun and the second reason is that it's really cool and when you see the birds it's really cool. My favorite birds that I saw today were the ones in the lake, I think. They were the Canadian geese. I saw the babies. They look like teeny yellow brown chicks. That is so cute. There's like six of them. I like boarding with my friends. I like seeing the white wing blackboard. I like the white wing blackboard because uh, the old blackboards are all black, but the wedding blackboard has red and yellow on its way. Got it. All right. The competition is a good motivator, but the real reward of bird watching runs much deeper for this group. I tell myself that sort of my underlying motive here is to make them appreciate the environment. Uh, I've taught a course in environmental science for a long time and, and you can feed the kids all kinds of information about how we need to save the environment and how we need to recycle and how we need to save water. But really the best route toward a healthy environmental ethic is to allow them to see things in nature, learn about them and eventually love them. And when they do that, then the, their appreciation for nature is already there. After adding a few more birds to their list, the teams recount their progress in Rome. All right, guys, it looks like we're doing great with the, with the songbirds. There's a few easy things we still haven't seen that, that I hope we could pick up. We should be able to get some of the egrets, like the great egret. We should be able to get a few ducks. And we don't have to turn in our list until six. If we get there with some time to spare, there's a lot of woods there, and we can just go and see if we can pick up those last few species while we're there. Now it's time to hit the road and try to make it to Charlie Elliott before the 6 p.m. deadline. Oh, I, we saw one of these. At Charlie Elliott, the group keeps birding to the very last minute. There's two of them. Oh, I see, oh, I see them, babe. It's the king bird. The high school kids have racked up an impressive number of species, more than 75. Is that a duck over here? See, see the little speck on the water? Yeah, I do. And the younger group has also fared quite well, positively identifying more than 20 different species of birds. Not bad. And we've been working all year for this with learning different birds, and so it really just comes down to today. I'm having a treat. Now that the birding is done, it's time for the teams to check in and register their lists. We had a, a large checklist written up on the wall for kids to add all the species that they found. We gave them their t-shirts and their checklists of Georgia birds. I think we did well. We may not have won, but we tried our best and that's all that really counts in the end. We got a chance to use the knowledge that we've been working on all year and it was great.
At Charlie Elliott, the groups are treated to a bird of prey show, and soon after, it's time for the awards. Judging is conducted by age group. The teenagers fared quite well, but came in just under the winning count. But the seven and eight year olds win the prize for their age group. The Kinglets with 22 birds. Come on down, Kinglets. For both teams, it's an impressive start to a long career birding. A little bit high, but believe it or not, we had 180 species found in this group in the state of Georgia today. I think, give yourself a hand. Organized birding events offer a great introduction to the world of bird watching. The longest running, widest reaching such event is the Christmas bird count. It's a cold December morning at the Rum Creek Wildlife Management Area near Forsyth, and this group is ready to see some birds. The Christmas bird counts have been going for 105 or 106 years now. It's the longest running citizen science um, project out there. Uh, they, it started right around the 1900s and the basic way that they're run is that each count is a center point and then it's a, it's a seven and a half mile radius circle drawn around that point so it's a circular count. They started with a few around 1900 and now there's close to 30 or maybe even more than that just in the state of Georgia. I think the Christmas bird count is an ideal example of uh, citizen science. You think about the thousands of pairs of eyes that are looking for birds across the country. There's no way that the U.S. government, any state agency, any private conservation group could ever pay for that kind of survey. Well, I always used to go out with my dad, like hunting and fishing and stuff like that. And I just like being outdoors. Bird watching was a good place to meet up with people that like that kind of stuff. Good excuse to go out. I do it because I enjoy obviously looking at the birds. Through birding, I've gotten to know quite a few people from around different parts of the state. It's just a delightful way to go out and see the birds, enjoy nature, and spend the day with friends. Rum Creek offers a lot of bird watching opportunities. The Rum Creek Wildlife Management Area is adjacent to Piedmont National Wildlife Refuge, which holds 35,000 acres of protected forest habitat. Three green wings. The Piedmont area through Georgia, uh, you don't have any mountains or anything here, but you've got so many rivers and lakes, there's reservoirs of all kinds, and uh, because of all these rivers and such, uh, it brings in a great diversity of these different birds. We see a lot of waterfowl in this area, uh, ducks, all different kinds of ducks, and if we're fortunate, we'll see some hawks and some eagles and some uh, wild turkeys. The group counts all day, and once the sun goes down, the numbers are tallied to be combined with other counts across the country. Red-throated loon. 45. That's a new count record. There are a lot of different birding activities that go on through the year, but nothing compares with the Christmas bird count. I think that if I had to compare it to any other sporting event, that would have to be the World Series. Indeed, it is the World Series of birding that's held every December. If you enjoy bird watching and want to make a contribution to the scientific community, there are many citizen science projects to get involved with. Here are a few. The Great Backyard Bird Count happens over a four day period each winter, usually in February. Participants count birds for as little as 15 minutes a day and report their findings to a national database. Project Feeder Watch is a winter long survey of birds that visit feeders at backyards, nature centers, community areas, and other locales in North America. Feeder watchers periodically count the highest number of each species they see at their feeders from November through early April. eBird.org is an online resource that allows anyone with an interest in birds to submit observations and retrieve data on bird populations across the country. For links and information on these and other citizen science projects, visit www.birdsource.com. Like birds, butterflies attract a lot of attention from folks who enjoy the outdoors, and a group of citizen scientists have stepped up to the task of helping to document them. Each year, hundreds of butterfly counts are held across the country. The North American Butterfly Association hosts 11 counts in Georgia alone. One of the most popular counts is held every summer at the Monastery of the Holy Spirit near Conyers. The count also includes nearby Arabia Mountain and Panola Mountain. 
and it's led by Father Francis Michael, abbot of the monastery. Looks like we might get a little rain this morning, but it didn't stop us last year. Normally the butterfly count we start at 8.30 in the morning. It includes the monastery, Panola Mountain, and Arabia Mountain, and all the distance in between those three points. For the first five years, we, we stayed together as a single group. Today, for the first time, we broke into three groups to see if we could see more diverse butterflies. This is a beautiful uh, tiger swallowtail on purple coneflower. The Monastery, Arabia Mountain, and Panola Mountain are part of an area recently designated a National Natural Heritage Area, indicating the natural and historic significance of the region. The diverse habitat contained within and between these three locations is a great place to see butterflies. Even on a wet summer morning such as this, these beautiful bugs can be found everywhere. I was a long time bird watcher. Uh, so you're out in nature a lot and you see these little bugs flying around. Uh, and I got interested to see whether I could identify them. Bird watching and butterfly watching, it's the same type of individual. This, this uh, verbena is at least producing uh, some of our grass skippers. Like today's butterfly which, uh, count, considering the weather, which has been rainy, even so, I believe we're up to about um, 38 species or something like that, 39 species for the morning. Our average is 53. And so uh, hopefully we'll make our average. The butterfly count attracts people from different skill levels and backgrounds. This is my first butterfly count and I was really looking forward to it. I've been wanting to do it the last couple of years and finally made the time to do it. I've just always been a naturalist at heart. I've had a great day. Saw some good ones. See that? Nice brownish gray butterfly with this big yellow mark in here. This is the common wood nymph. My children used to call them fried egg butterflies. Well, I'm an entomologist by training. I have been interested in butterflies all my life. Georgia only has about 165 species of butterflies. So if a little bit of effort, you know, anybody can learn the butterflies of Georgia. It's a nice group of organisms to work with. Butterflies are also good indicators of the state of the environment. So it looks like a bunch of tiger swallowtails. You know, the butterfly population is part of the whole global uh, network. All of this stuff is connected. That's why I think it's so important to watch the butterflies. And so I think that's, that's the bottom line of it, is that we have to protect nature. Another growing hobby among nature lovers is dragonfly watching. And if you're interested in these fascinating insects, Charlie Elliott Nature Center's Dragonfly yeah, right Education there. Program is a great introduction. Okay, Charlie Elliott Wildlife Center is a 6,400-acre wildlife management area, public fishing area, and education center. The Dragonfly ID program is something we hold every year. It's very popular. Lots of folks that are interested in, in birds have also become interested in dragonflies, and since we have 22 lakes and ponds here, they're very abundant, and it, this place makes a great setting for a class like that. That's a roseate skimmer. Giff Beaton, a renowned birder and naturalist, leads the class. Author of several popular books on birding in Georgia, he recently compiled a comprehensive book on dragonflies and damselflies of the southeast. With a day job as a pilot, Giff is one of the most active citizen scientists in the state. Well, when I was a kid, I was really big into fishing, and I like to fish a lot and more than a lot of the other little kids, so I just found a couple of adults who didn't mind me tagging along and one of them literally knew everything. He knew all the flowers, all the trees, all the snakes, all the fish, all the birds. So I kind of got interested in classifying things. Of over 5,000 species of dragonflies and damselflies on Earth, Georgia is home to about 172. Dragonflies and damselflies share many similar characteristics, but dragonflies are generally larger. Another easy way to tell the two apart is by their wings. Damselflies rest with their wings folded, while dragonflies extend both pairs when resting. And if you have binoculars, a little thing you can do with them is you can turn them backwards and use them like a little magnifying glass. Uh, this is kind of a general program for beginners. It's for people who maybe don't know that much about dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, we get a lot of interesting questions, especially from the kids. See ya. Some folks talk about this disease that's going around called nature deficit disorder. 
we feel like it's really important to get kids connected to nature early on because they'll be always able to enjoy the outdoors for the rest of their lives. This one has just changed from being a female to being a male. It's wonderful. Really, I'd recommend it for everybody. Learned a lot about the life stages uh, in the class, and I'm trying to learn how to net these. There's so much variety, you can never get bored, whether you're a beginner or whether you've been studying dragonflies for years. In the summer, dragonflies are plentiful, and their populations can be important environmental indicators. Basically, almost any wet habitat can be utilized by some type of dragonfly or damselfly. And unfortunately, Georgia is such a fast-growing state that we're losing a lot of those habitats. It's just going to be really important in the next 50 or 100 years to try to preserve the habitats that we have left. Isn't that pretty? Citizen science can be an, an important part of an appreciation of nature. There's a lot of things we can do as sort of non-professionals to add to the advancement of a particular study, try to just help the professionals because there's frankly not enough of them. In order to ensure the future health of wildlife populations, the work of individuals like these is an invaluable tool. So why not get out there and become a citizen scientist yourself? All it takes is a little knowledge and a drive to make a contribution to your world. Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible by a grant from Mary Hall Singleton and by the Imlay Foundation. Thank you.